All right, hello everyone. Welcome back to the channel. Uh, today I'm going to be doing part one of probably three, talking about the World Championships of Warhammer in Atlanta, where I attended last weekend. Uh, as I am recording this now, it is Wednesday, um, so I've been home for a couple days. I'm mostly recovered, although I'm still very tired, um, despite not partying hard there. Um, I'm an old man. <laughs> um, it was a very good time. Um, met some cool people. I met, you know, met a couple of people who I've seen their names. I met a couple of people from overseas, which was very cool. Um, I chatted not at length, but shortly once or twice with, um, oh my gosh, I think his name is Matt, um, the lead rules designer for AOS, who, like, all weekend, I was like, this dude looks so familiar. Where do I know this guy from? And then it was like Sunday during the finals, I realized, oh shit, he, he looks familiar because he's in the Meta Watch videos and he's the lead rules designer for AOS. Um, so I was amused by the fact that I just like could not at all place where I knew him from. You know, he had a he had one of the yellow um, you know, GW staff shirts, like the people running the event. I just could not place him. So, um, yeah, it was, um, I thought the event was well run, especially for the first time doing this. Um, I, you know, I talked to him because all of the judges and like staff were all walking around for much of the time, um, just like checking in with people, seeing how things were going, you know, oh, how's your game going? Oh, your army looks nice. Um, trying to keep people on track of, um, for timing and the rounds. So like, Judges were going around asking, like, how's the game going? Are you behind? Are you looking good? Um, you know, just staying on top of things if, like, they were going to be needed to help talk out a game or, you know, help in any way. So I thought that all was done very well. Um, Mike Brandt uh, has a great announcer voice. I'll give him that. <laughs> um, he did a good job kind of officiating the event as, as the lead TO type person. Um, oh my god, other high-level thoughts. Um, I would totally do it again. Um, I think if I did it again, I I don't regret bringing the Cruel Boys and focusing on bringing my best painted army. Um, but I think if I did it again, it would be nice to win some more games. Um, and I would bring something a little bit more competitive. Um, so to get right to results, uh, I'm not going to be coy about this. Uh, I won two games, so I went two and six. Um, I obviously did not expect to get out of groups in the top two by any means. I did not expect to be in the, the winner's bracket at all. I thought there was 0% chance of that. Uh, my goal was to win four games. I was hoping I could go four and four. Um, so that did not happen. Uh, I won two. I uh, lost six. Um, I will say, I'll get into this more later in the videos, um, I do think game one was winnable had I played it better and had just a little better luck. Um, I think game two was also winnable, uh, and I think I actually lost that one off of an incorrect judge ruling, <laughs> which is sad and frustrating, uh, but I'll get into that. Um, I think in this video, I'll just talk about day one, which was games one and two. Uh, in the next video, I'll talk about day two, which was the three game day, and then I'll cram um, both of the last two days into the um, into part three. That's kind of the plan for this coverage. Um, I'll talk a little bit in this video about like the overall standings and like what all went down, um, as well as the paint judging um, and all that stuff. So so. I'll do overall standings in this video, and I'll talk about my games at length um, after that. Um, so yeah, went two and six. Again, game one was winnable. My opponent was definitely better than me. Game two was winnable. Game three, I had just no idea what to do <laughs> against the army I faced. Game four was winnable and then i think my last two matchups just felt like very bad like matchup losses so i went two and two or sorry two and six but i felt like four and four was a reasonable goal and i could have 
hit that with a little bit better play and just like a little bit better luck, asking a different judge for ruling, stuff like that. Um, so I was I was happy coming out of Worlds two and six. It was eighty seven of the best people in the world, best AOS players in the world. Like you can't be sad about winning two games. Um, I think I think these standings include. Um, include paint judging, but I'm not sure because I see here that I'm above some people who had three wins. Actually, no, I, I think this is th this doesn't include paint judging then. So even though I had two wins, I am above some people with three wins because I did have more battle points, I guess, than them. So I had 143, this person had 132. Um, no, they had... All right, John had 184. So this must include, this must also include paint judging. Um, I should go to games. I should go to Warcom. Because they had a blog going on the whole time that had the like live standings on it. Um, so if you wanted to follow along live with the standings during the event, um, you could have done it there. Let's see if I can find this. Here we go, live blog, I think this was it. Uh, so if we scroll down here, um, so yeah, Nicholas uh, with Lumineth took first. Apparently he's known as Spoon. I um, don't know what that's all about, but good job to him. Oh my gosh, I have to scroll incredibly far to get to the live standing table, if it's even here anymore. Might not even be here anymore. All right. Well, I guess it's not up anymore. That. Uh, I think it was probably at the top. All right. Well, anyway. Turns out the table I'm looking for is not up here anymore. Oh well. I, I think this is. I think this includes um, paint judging. So I didn't come at the bottom. There were, you know, there were some people who only won. One game, although um, few and far between. Uh, Josh Bennett had to drop actually due to like family emergency. I was supposed to play him round five, uh, and instead I played a local who subbed in for him. Um, so I think only like two of these games, maybe three, were actually Josh, and the rest were the sub. Um, and um, he was not somebody who qualified, so he was just... no no shade to him at all. You know, thank for him for stepping up and subbing in, but like probably a little bit outclassed here by everyone else. Um, and I did play him, so I'll talk about his list when I when I talk about that game. Um, you can see, other than that sub, nobody had zero wins, which is awesome. And actually, nobody was undefeated for the weekend as well. So I feel like that speaks a lot to the level of competition and the level of people who were playing. Um, was even at the very top, you know, in that winner's bracket, um, nobody in that bracket ended up undefeated for the weekend. Um, so yeah, I think Nicholas must have lost a game in the bracket, and I think Tom got out of his group at 4 1. So, and Phil, Phil must have lost the last game of his bracket too. Yeah, so not everyone who got. Mathematically, obviously, not everybody who is going to get out of the bracket would be a 5-0 because it was the top two of every bracket. Um, so necessarily, some of the people who got out of their group into the championship bracket had a loss. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, Nicholas, like I said, won with a techless list. No Sentinels, though. Um, so this was a Calgrave, a Cathaler, Techless, Blade of Eltherion. Two, uh, no, ten wardens, five blade lords, and then two by five dawn riders, three by five dawn riders. That's cute. And then three endless spells. Um, I heard some people saying, like, I don't know, I don't know how he's winning with this list. Um, I mean, I guess Teclis is always good, and dawn riders are very fast. Um, but I didn't really see any of his games, so I don't know. Um, Tom. 
was playing uh, Skaven with all the bells. Um, I had, oh my god, do I have the picture? I don't have the picture in my in my little gallery here. I I took a picture of um, it was Ted Ted Megan's Mayans. I don't know. Um, and Matt, I hope I'm getting the name right. Matt, the the AOS rules lead. Um, we're both watching the finals as the finals were happening, and I had this. I got this great picture of Matt, the AOS rules lead, just like with this absolute look of like disgust on his face watching the finals. And I was just like, that is the look of a man who is figuring out how he's going to nerf screaming bells in the morning on Monday or whenever he gets home. Um, because it was, it was just a little bit gross. Um, he was running Plague Furnace, three bells, two by 15 sensor bearers. And then I don't think anything else super mattered. Um, the Skevix Plague Pack was pretty popular. Um, did have some clan rats and a plague priest. Um, yeah, the final match was interesting. It was a double elimination bracket, and since um, uh, Lumineth won the first game against Tom, but Tom was at the top of the bracket, so the Lumineth had to beat him again. Um, Spoon Nicholas had to beat Tom again, um, and everyone was like, "Ooh, the last like if that happened, then the last round was going to be on." Um, Powerflex, which seemed very Lumineth favored because you get points for having Acolytes standing on points in that, and Tom didn't have any Acolytes, where the Lumineth did. Um, and you also get points for killing Wizards, so if Lumineth did kill like the Graziers, that would be more points for, for the Lumineth. Um, and it just seemed a very... Um, that was a very difficult map for the Skaven to compete with this Lumineth list for the final. Um, the other people in the bracket were Phil with Gitz, um, Rania with Soulblight, Christopher with OBR, Tom with OBR. By the way, this was um, this OBR was the crematorians list that I thought was silly that was in my group. So nuts to me, because it wasn't that silly. Um, it was just six Immortus Guard, two by five Death Riders, and characters, double Mortark, which I guess still has some legs to it. Uh, and I'm sure also he played it very well. Um, it's good for him. Tom was playing the, the Morgas list. And then filling out the top eight bracket was Carson with the Meat Fist list and Benji with Big Wog, which I don't know which Big Wog list this was. Orgog Prophet, Weird Knob, Mega Boss, War Chanter, War Chanter. Oh, that's weird. This isn't, this doesn't have Gobs Wreck in it. Um, it had Brutes, Brutes. Got Rippa's, Gore Grunches, Gore Grunches. You have to have something Cruel Boys to enable the Cruel Boys tactic. Because um, that's part of what Big Wog does, is just get an easy five tactics. So yeah, this is just Iron Jaws with, <laughs> instead of Gobsprack, Got Rippa's. So. All right, cool. Um, all right. I talked about overall. Talk about painting a little bit. Um, as I said, I brought my Cruel Boys because they're my best painted list, and I was working my butt off for like two weeks before trying to get them like a step up from where they were. So going cross-eyed, just painting little stitches, model on all of the robes and stuff like that, and finishing my last 10 Gut Rippas and my last Shaman. Um, I ended up coming in a four-way tie for fourth place in painting, so just below the podium. Um, from what I saw, the first place painting list, the moment I saw it, I was just like, yep, that's first place. <laughs> like, there's literally no comp like no, no question, no competition, that's first place. Um, second place was very good, but I would say a minor step down from that list. And then I felt like, I don't know if I actually got a good look at the, the list that ended up coming in third for paint, um, but I felt like it was kind of... First place was very clear. Second place was a minor step down from that. Like, definitely wasn't going to beat the first place list, but was a cut above um, third place. And then I felt like between third and that tranche of like four people in fourth place, I felt those were more comparable. Um, so the way the pain judging worked was during the first round on Thursday, judges came around. 
and they put you in a bucket, either 30 points, 50 points, or 70 points for painting. And then everybody who got put into the 70 point bucket, which was the showcase bucket, um, set up their armies Thursday evening after the first two games were done. And then the judges came around and judged in detail all of the lists, uh, sorry, all of the armies. And um, they could give either, so there were three judges and each of them could either give between minus five and plus five to that 70 points. So you could end up with anywhere from, if you were in that 70 bracket, you could either end up between, sorry, you could end up anywhere between 55 and 85 points. Um, so I ended up at 76, so I was positive from the initial 70 ranking. Um, and I don't know what the, I don't know what like first had. I assume, I assume first was like, you know, 83 to 85. Second place was probably like 82. And then third place, I would guess was like 78, 77, maybe just like a tiny cut above the fourth place group. And then, like I said, there were four of us at 76 for painting. So I was very happy with that. Um, the painting level was a little bit higher than I expected. I wasn't sure if anybody would be bringing like an incredibly gorgeous army um, to this, but um, it does make sense now that I think about it because some events did hand out their golden ticket to like the best overall winner rather than the best general. So there were some people there with very nice armies. Um, I do have some pictures of those, which I can pull up now. Um, so this was the first place army. This was just an absolutely gorgeous Nurgle army that was basically flawless. Um, by oh, it, Tom, I think something. Let me just look for Nurgle. Yes, it was Thomas Oliver. Um, won first place for painting. Um, and I believe he's on Instagram as Tomo Paints. You want to look at T O M O paints. Uh, if you want to go look him up and follow his stuff, it's probably worth it because, like I said, this army was just gorgeous. Um, yeah, just like I, said, I, I took one look at it. Like I said, I took one look at it and I was like, this is first place. This is ridiculous. Um, so, cannot be mad about losing out to that. I think I had one more, right? I had a better close up of this. So, like, even the plague bearers, the little boils on the stomachs, he painted his eyes, and they're like, you know, they've got irises and pupils and highlighting, and like, geez, man. <laughs> well done. <laughs> well done. That's all I can say. Um, some other nice armies. I was almost surprised that this, this might have been in the top four chunk with me. I'm not sure, though. Um, but I thought it was a very nice corn army. Um, Sorry, this is taking a little bit to load in, like, full resolution. Um, but yeah, I thought this was a very nice corn army that caught my eye. Just pretty clean. Um, I could have seen this being in the top four trench with me. Um, this was John Wareka's army, which was I know was in the top four with me. Um, so a nice um, soul blade army with some conversions and some nice painting. Um, really like the two. This is the zombie dragon and Neferata, which you can see Neferata is a converted Stormcast um, dragon. And then this is not 100% sure what this is. It might be part of the flying Nazgul from Lord of the Rings, but I'm not sure. Um, this was another very nice Soulblight army. Um, no idea where this paint placed or who painted it, but nice job. Also, I love this old white model, um, the White King. Um, but yeah, just pretty clean. I like this one. Um, oh, I think this this might have been this may have been third place painting. Don't remember if Carson got third. Um, I do remember I took a picture of the top view of the mall pot because I quite liked it. Um, that has some like little freehand tattoos on his Abgrats, who I believe were standing in his Noblars. Um, yeah, nice, nice ogre army. Ooh, this was Chai uh, 
who I played is Corn Army, um, double conversions, and it's pretty nice. And this was this was so along with John Mareka, this was also one of the ones that was tied for fourth with myself. Um, and I did also play him. He's a good dude. Um, yeah, didn't quite make top three. Um, we were talking a little bit, and it sounded like he asked the judges for feedback, and like, like the green flames, like the OS. There wasn't really OSL for that matching, you know, up to the quality that the blue was. Um, you know, it's all very dramatic, but maybe the um, the actual like technical quality of some of it isn't as high as it could have been. Um, so very striking army. But just you know, along with me, <laughs> a slight technical level below like the the top two or three. Um, there were a lot of well painted Iron Jaws army, so like this wasn't wasn't top three or anything, but it was nice. Quite liked it. Um, I don't know if it's just a function of like the low model count, so all the Iron Jaws players like do a good job. Because um, this was another one. Um, probably also lends itself well to like contrast painting, I guess, uh, using contrast paints on like the armor and stuff. So pretty easy to like, pretty good army to like slap chop and have a good looking army. I'm not saying that's what either of these did. I'm just speculating. Uh, yep, there's the Nurgle again that were ridiculous. That's, I was saying, the top view of this small pot just kind of caught my eye. I thought that was very nice. Uh, Right, this was the second place army. This was Ricky Fisher from the northwest of the US. Um, you know, Matt Beasley, who's in one of the discords I'm in, um, knows Ricky and he plays up there. Um, I didn't get a chance to talk to him. I should have tried to make him in it. Um, but a very nice Gibbs army. Um, yeah, just again, nice and clean, good colors, very well painted. Can't be sad about losing to this army. Um, I do think my bases got me up a little more um, closer to this stuff because, like, the painting on the first, you know, the top two is definitely better than mine, but, like, I think my bases were maybe the best. Um, and people were commenting all weekend, like, ah, oh, the bases are so sick, you know, the, the swamp stuff, it's so cool. So I was very gratified. Um, by that, I was very happy that people people thought my stuff was was good. Um, I was very sad. My duck, my this is one of my pot routes. Um, the resin three D print, and I put too strong of a magnet on the bottom, so I tried to pick it up off the tray, and it just popped off its feet instead, <laughs> which is unfortunate. Um, so rip to the little duck. Um, but there you can see some of my bases. They're swampy. Uh, all right, so let's get into the actual games. Like I said, I'm going to do games one and two in this video, um, and then I'll do game two in another one. Um, game one, I was on stream, so I will include the link to this stream um, in the description for the video. If you want, you can go back and watch the stream. Um, I haven't watched the whole thing, but I found the stream a bit disappointing in that, um, well, for a couple reasons. Um, the first reason is this, it's actually a single stream for both AOS and 40k, so they're kind of swapping between the games, and they're keeping, um, I believe they're keeping the score up to date, uh, yeah, here we go, 3, 5, that doesn't seem accurate, I don't know what's down there, might be score, oh, he got 5. First turns though. Anyway, we we oh we were also I think we also were so we had a little tablet next to us where we were keeping like, like we were putting in our scores and we didn't fully understand the format of the thing we were putting the scores in. So the scores maybe this was our fault. The scores were wrong for a little while, um, but I'll I'll go through what the what the score was every every round as I'm going through it. Um, oh, that's nice green. There we go. But yeah, here you can see, you know, they're sw swapping between 40k and AOS, which was like the worst of both worlds because it made nobody happy. The 40k players were always sad when um, 
the AOS stream was on, and the AOS players were sad when the 40k stream was on. And the other thing, so so that was one thing that was not ideal for this. I do think, like GW, you, you figure out how to have two separate streams. I have confidence in you um, <laughs> for next year. Um, the other thing from watching the stream a little bit, the commentators did not seem super knowledgeable, particularly like about the game or about AOS. And their commentary wasn't really, like they weren't giving commentary on what was going on in the game, really. Like they were more just talking about like, oh, this is a sludge raker. He's a hitty monster. Like, oh, the armies are so cool. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe later in the stream, it got more into like what was actually going on. Um, but, but yeah, just the from from what I saw of this game, the quality of the commentary it was almost more just like color commentary more than like, oh, Ricky's trying to do surround and destroy. Oh, he he miscast this thing. That's gonna blah blah blah. Um, so. Yeah, I just I, th I think they could level up the stream a little bit next year. Do two separate streams for AOS and 40k at least, and maybe have um, I don't know. Maybe maybe I'll have to I'll have to go back and watch the stream for the finals. Maybe that was better. Um, but have you know, maybe have a little more knowledgeable commentary about like what is going on in the game and a little more play by play rather than just like generic like more general. More, yeah, more general, like common, not com uh, color commentary was kind of from the fifteen minutes of this I watched um, seemed to be more what they were doing. Um, but yeah, it was cool to be on stream. Um, I've been on stream at Tables and Towers, and I didn't really find it intimidating or anything. I was kind of expecting, uh, you know, I was going into worlds kind of expecting to get my butt kicked, and I was like, if that happens on stream, that's fine. <laughs> I, I was not really stressed by it. I wasn't really worried. Um, and it was cool that my friends back home, you know, I was texting everybody like, ah, I'm on stream, go watch this. Um, so going back and watching the video, I was like, oh, I can see one or two of my friends commenting in Twitch chat. Um, it was very cool uh, that they got to got to watch live or semi-live as I was playing. Um, so yeah, that was cool. Uh, who was I playing? Round one, I was playing, let me just go to myself. Uh, let me pull myself up. It's around when I was playing Damien Avon from France. Um, he seemed like a good guy. Um, and he was playing Skaven without the bells. So this was a thankful list. Um, I went over this in one of my previous videos, getting ready for WCW. Just got a couple gray seers, Thankwall, Plague Priest, this new Skavic guy. Um, Three units of clan rats, two units of fifteen sensor bearers, and two warp grinders. So, you know, both sensor bearer units starting in reserve with the warp grinders, and then you've got three in this list. You have three chances to fish for that nine inch charge. Um, he told me right off the bat he was like, you know, explaining his list, blah blah blah, and he's like, I have the triumph for rerolling charges. And I immediately was like, No, you don't. <laughs> Your list says you have indomitable. And it surprised me reading your list because I was like, why doesn't he have the reroll charge triumph? Um, but I was like, yeah, dude, sorry, but it says on your list you have indomitable. So he was like, oh, whoops, that I don't know if that was a mistake. I don't yeah, whatever. I don't I don't think he was like trying to pull one over on me, like, oh, I think this game it would be better to have the reroll charge. Um, I think he probably just messed up and put the wrong one on his list or just forgot which one it was. But this is why you review list beforehand, is I was like, mm, no, you don't have that triumph. You have this one, because <laughs> that's what your list says. Um, so good to be prepared. Um, let's see. I took a couple pictures. So just talking. Oh, I was going to talk about this general stuff about the tournament. Um, so you can see here, um, they gave us this nice like printed out packet with all of the rules for the weekend. And it also had printouts of all of the battle plans, which was nice. Um, so you could have, you know, you could be looking up other stuff in your rulebook in your GHB, um, or have that, you know, open to a page where you know you're going to need some rules uh, and still have the battle plan rules open from the packet, which was nice. Um, 
one, I think Towers in the Tundra. I, th I think the printout was before the um, or the FAQ that changed uh, one or two of the uh, battle plans. So that was a minor unfortunate thing. Um, and then terrain. Uh, so every table is pretty standard. Um, we had two pieces of cover that were basically in the corners, and the the stuff on top you could just move. It was just there for looking nice. Um, and then we had, every table had a garrison, basically in the middle of each deployment zone. And then every table either had two impassable pieces in the middle and two wildwoods on the side, or in the other corners, whichever corners the cover wasn't in, or had the two wildwoods in the center and the impassable in the other corners. So that is fairly reasonable, but I would have liked... A little more variety in the setups of the tables. So yeah, we, we just had two options. It was either the Wildwoods in the center or the Impassable in the center and then the other one in the corners. It would have been nice if some of the tables had like the garrisons in the middle or the cover in the middle and like the Impassable and like somewhere else and just like a little bit of a different setup. And you could even do something like order your um, order your battle plans so that your train set up for one day, you know, is going to work for every battle plan with the location of the objectives, um, and then like the next day, switch them up a little bit in a way that's going to work for the other battle plans for the next day. Because um, it got a little bit, I didn't get uh, it got a little bit stale, just being like, all right. I know, I know it's either going to be impassable or wildwoods in the middle every game. No matter what. It was just a little bit late. <laughs> it was a little bit late. Um, I guess it was a pretty fair way to do it. Um, it also felt... Did it feel bad? Yeah, it felt bad. I hit, I hit Sylvaneth on um, a table where the wildwoods are in the middle, <laughs> which felt bad. Uh, but that's not... That's not like the fault of the general um, strategy, the way they did terrain. It was just the luck of the draw for a table. Um, right, so that is the that's the basic layout of all the tables. Uh, my first game was against, like I said, Damien with Skaven. This was most of the way through deploying. Um, as I said, I lost this game. To a couple small mistakes, and I, th I had a, I had a little bit of a tricksy plan for turn one, and I think I should have committed even harder to my turn one plan to make sure it worked. Knowing that you know, I, I knew I was going to get turn one. I should have committed to it even a little bit harder than I did. Um, so I will explain in a second. Um, but just to go over deployment, um, he had null holes, three null holes, as you can see. Um, this is Thanquil, a Grey Seer, and a Plague Priest here, and then a screen of clan rats. Get another unit of clan rats over here with Skavik Plague Pack thing behind it. Um, and then I think he started with a Grey Seer way in the back for like a magic dominance. Uh, and then the third unit of Grace here, or not Grace here, third unit of clan rats that's not deployed here was deployed over here in this wildwood on this flank. Um, I don't really know what the plan for them was, whatever, they were there. Uh, and then the two warp grinders and the sensor bearers were obviously in reserve. Um, this is on. Gotta look it up. I didn't write down what the battle plan was. You're probably smarter than me. You can see it's got three, um, three across. Oh, it was um, lines of communication, right? Because we could disrupt a turn, and we forgot that turn one. <laughs> so we could disrupt. Whoever's going second each round, each battle round, can choose a phase to disrupt. And you can issue commands in that phase. On a three up, it'll take two CP instead of one. And we forgot that turn one. But then I tried to have us remember it for the rest of the game. Um, so he was something like 14 drops. He was a bajillion drops. So this was like the only game I actually got to decide whether to go first or second. Um, my 
plan. So the way he deployed, I was like, all right, he is not thinking about my dirty tricks. I can pick up this unit of clan rats. And this was kind of what I was hoping the whole time during deployment. I was like, I hope he's going to deploy so that I can get to his characters and pick up the clan rats turn one with Disappearing Act, and he's not going to have any bodyguard saves from Master Clan onto the clan rats, and I can pick up maybe Thankwall first turn. Uh, that would have been great <laughs> if I did that. Um, I think it was a good plan. Um, I, yeah, like I mean, you can see there's four characters right here. If I just pick up the scene of clan rats, shove into them, I can maybe pick up Thankful turn one. And then at that point, um, in my head, I think if that had happened, if I pick up Thankful turn one, and these clan rats are gone, I think he kind of has to commit one of the plague sensor bear units to clean up my guys there, um, which takes some pressure off the rest of my army. Um, because I spent a lot of time, I spent a lot of effort in the first three turns trying to screen out, not just screen out the Plague Sensor Bears coming in at all, but trying to screen out if they were going to get the double turn. And that made me cede a little bit too much presence on the objectives, I think. Um, anyway, so um, you see my deployment down here. I just have double Hobgrat screens on the one flank for the Sensor Bears. I have um, 10 and my 20 Gut Rippas. I have the Killbow on the flank. I think James walked by and was like, is that supposed to be there? And I was like, yeah, <laughs> it is. Um, I mainly wanted, I don't know, I was like, the Killbow is semi-expendable in this, and like, if that is a layer of screen against the sensor bearers when they come in, that's fine. Um, I have my three Bolt Boys, and I think there was a Shaman behind Gobsprack. Gobsprack, Shaman, garrisoning this, this was a garrison, was the um, six Bolt Boys, Bloodraker, um, so, so like I said, my plan here, I was like, I'm going to pick up the clan rats. I'm going to be able to shoot Thankwall with the Bolt Boys who are going to pop out of the garrison. And that doesn't count as a move, so they'll still have their 24-inch range into that. Um, I was going to, I think Thankwall was out of sight of this, so I could have done this a little better. Um, all right, so what ended up happening, right, this is right after, this is finishing, right, this is after we started turn one. So I did succeed in picking up two of the clan rat units, and he told me after the game, after that, he was like, oh shit, like I didn't think about that. Like he didn't think about the dirty tricks, he didn't think about disappearing act, uh, and he was worried, he was worried at this point, which he should have been. Um, you can see I super sneakied up the Nash tooth over to here, just to be able to make sure I get the charge into them. Um, and this, yeah, so this was like going into my hero phase turn one. I finest houred the Nash Duke because I knew I was going to be sending him in with the beast skill slot to try and kill Thankwell. I almost forgot about the beast skill slot. Um, so turn one, I did take that Isakas. So do 10 wounds to him without doing 10 wounds to me. Back. Um, I did get that one. I almost failed. Um, but what happened, what ended up happening was, um, I moved, I ended up moving the kill though up onto the left point just to tag that and take it. I ended up moving the gut rippers up into the space between the impassable here to take this objective. I think I just barely tagged this one with my, with a unit of Hobgrots and then like ran the other one this way to stand next to a null hole and like deny coming out of that. Um, I was kind of planning for my killbow to go stand next to the other null hole so he could come up with that one. And then, um, yeah, like the Sludge Raker moved up, Gobsprack moved up a bit, um, whatever. Let me see. Yeah, so this is this was the, this is essentially the end of turn one. So you can see I just moved everything up, I tagged some points, uh, I put the Bold Boys out, and the Nash Duke did get in to Thankwall. So what ended up happening this turn? And I'll, and I'll explain what I think I should have done, because I think I could have won this game if I had gone harder on my turn one plan into Thankwell and rolled better. <laughs> um, so in the shooting phase, the six Bolt Boys shot at Thankwell, did one wound to him. And I was just like, all right, 
fuck me. Like, I was thinking they were going to maybe do five wounds to Thankwall. He's got 16. Um, the, you know, the Nash Troop goes in. He can throw the slop on. He can maybe do three. And then he's finest hour. He's got he's on twos and twos with eight attacks that do two damage each. Um, I think I didn't quite appreciate Thankwall has... Um, he has a four up base. And I think he he might have finest hour just, you know, <laughs> once he saw what was coming, I think he finest hour didn't think well. And then with, you know, all defense, whatever. Um, yeah, I only did one wound to think well in the shooting phase, which was miserable. I think I rolled one five up out of my seven shots. And I maybe also got one wound through the armor. And then he made like three of his four five up board saves. So right off the bat, I was like, oh shit, like, I think I actually need to get my tactics, so I need to do 10 wounds. I'm like, I'm off to a real bad start. I think I need the Nash Tooth to target the Gracier and the Plague Priest that were standing here to make sure I can get to 10 wounds. Um, I forgot to throw the slop on Thankwell at the start of the combat phase, but I remembered like right after I attacked, and he was nice enough to let me do it. And I actually rolled the 6 for the 2d6 mortals. And sadly, I only rolled five. So I rolled like well below. Yeah, it was lucky to hit the six, but then once I hit the six, I rolled below average on two dice for the number of mortals that I did to him. Um, if I had remembered, yeah, there's a world where I remembered to do that at the start. I hit, and I hit the six and did some wounds to him. And then I put everything into thank wall from the Nash Tooth. And if I don't kill him, at least hope to get him next turn, maybe. Um, but instead, um, I split my attacks between the Gracier and the Plague Priest, just making sure I could get to 10 um, for my tactic. So I killed the Gracier, and I think I did three or four wounds to the Plague Priest, so I didn't get both. I just got the Gracier. And he did nine wounds back to me. <laughs> so I was within a hair of failing my tactic because of that. He almost got the Nash Tooth. Uh, but instead, I got five. Um, I think I'll just go through the rest of the game before saying what I think I should have done first turn. So the rest of the game ended up being um, a tale of me never getting Thankwell. So he heals D3 at the end of the, every combat phase, which is just miserable if you don't one-shot him. Um, so after turn one, I had done like uh, so I, I did I rolled five mortals and then I think he saved one or two. But after, like, after turn one, he was already back up to only having taken two wounds. And then I think in his turn, he rolled a one and healed back up to only having taken one wound. So, like, I put all that effort into maybe getting Thankful turn one. And, like, by my turn two, he was basically back to full already. And for my effort, I had gotten a Gracier. And that did not work out well for me. Um, in his turn, he moved up onto... Is this the point? Why is that here? I should have known some timestamps here so I could show you on the video. Yeah, I think this is basically from his view in turn one. He moved clan rats onto this point. The clan rats he brought back down from the dirty trick. Um, he couldn't have moved turn one, so this must have been turn. He got the one two double, right? He, he took the he either took the one two double or I gave it to him, I believe. Um, so this must have been turn two. He he brought these down turn one, moved them onto here. Um, right, because he only got three points turn one. Um, so he did, right, he did magic down turn one, and then he took this point back with the unit of clan rats that I didn't pick up with my dirty trick. And then he couldn't take either of these because those clan rats had to come down in his deployment zone at the end of his move phase, so he couldn't really, he didn't really have stuff he could take these points back with. Um, so turn one worked out fairly well for me points-wise, even though I didn't do what I wanted to do by killing Thankwell. Um, if I killed Thankwell, I think I would have been in a really solid place to go on to maybe win this match. Um, he could have committed putting one of the Plague Sensor Bears down to make sure he got the five points turn one, and I kind of thought he was going to do that, but he decided not to. Um, so... Right. So he went second. Turn one, it was 5-3 to me. Turn two, 
he, I think turn, I think turn one, he had hit one of the great prayers, great plagues, whatever it is. He had like rolled a six on the prayer to get the power up so that all of his prayers were like re-rollable or on two up, whatever the buff is. So turn two, um, right, turn two, I decided, since I was going second, I decided to disrupt the charge phase in case he was going to try and bring down the plague sensor bearers to make it harder to re-roll the charge. And I also, th I think I also had, um, I think I also had Boggy Mist up. Um, I had kept, I believe I kept a shaman out of, this shaman I think was out of dispel range, so he cast Boggy Mist. Um, because I said that was going to be really important to keep that up for when the Plague Sensor Barriers come down, to make them a 10-inch charge the turn they come in, and basically assume that I'm safe. Um, and then if he gets the double, he's only getting them in one turn. So I was like feeling, I was feeling good, I was feeling okay at this point, despite not getting Fankwall. Um, so this is his turn too, he took back, you know, he had this point, he took back this point, he had corrupted the, from his perspective, uh, the left objective, from my perspective, the right objective. Um, uh, so that only the Scavix Plague Pack could hold that. Um, this is another mistake that I think I made. I think instead of picking up the Clan Rats unit on my left, I should have picked up the one that was in front of that Plague Pack unit, so that if he wanted to take any objective... Well, I guess, whatever. I guess he could have taken the left one with the Clan Rats, but the... The plague pack thing, where if the if the little dudes are on the objective and it's corrupted, nobody else can contest that objective. Turns out it's really annoying when there's t also twenty clan rats sitting between you and the guys you need to kill to be able to contest the objective. Um, it wasn't that big of a deal because my game plan, I had decided to fight over the left two objectives and just concede the right one to him anyway. Um, but it may have been better to take that right unit of clan rats instead of the left one so that the plague pack couldn't just stand behind them like turn two um and hold that point um so yeah so he got five turn two he he succeeded the prayer battle tactic and he took back the points my turn two i made a big mistake um this is a little further along so i hope i'm not like copyright infringing their stream or something, whatever. And 10 people are going to watch this. <laughs> um, I made a big mistake here on my turn too. I moved up, I auto ran six, the unit of 10 gut ribbons to get um, enough people, enough of them on the point to take this back. So I was doing sneak up. Yeah, one of the other things. So sneak up, I had to move... Um, I had to move the kill bow. I ran it over to this null hole to be within three of terrain um, for the tactic. And then I had to auto run six these gut ribbas up to the point to have enough on the point to take it back from these clan rats. So it was very close to fit them all in. I had 11 inches. He was slightly skeptical, but I was like, I met, you know, I measured it out. I, I have I have enough that I can get on the point and not be within nine inches of the clan rats to have them redeploy onto the point, which would have screwed me. So I was smart enough to avoid that. The thing I was not smart enough to avoid was I just forgot that clan rats just bring models back in the battle shock phase. So I, not having any other real target to shoot at, just incredibly stupidly shot at the clan rats and killed a few. So then in the battle shock, you know, he just took off the ones in the back, and in the battle shock phase, he brought them back onto the point. And he rolled, let's see, he had one, two, three. I think he had nine on the point, and I had ten. He must, so I think he needed to roll. Yeah, I think he needed to bring back two or three, and he did. If he had rolled and just only brought back one, I would have been okay. But he did roll up enough to bring back and keep that point. So I only took three points in battle round two. So we were tied. And then I believe he won the roll off turn three and gave me the double which was very unfortunate and sad for me because I wanted to give him the turn because it was turn three and he was going to have to commit the Plague Sensor Bearers wherever he was going to commit them. So this was not the turn that I wanted to get the double. Uh, so that was unfortunate. Um, many other unfortunate things happened this turn. <laughs> so I did Surround and Destroy. 
Um, I had Hopgratz over on the one flank. I had the Kilbo over on this flank. And I had a Shaman sitting back in the back. So I was like well set up to do this. Um, this is like turn four, I think. Um, yeah, so I was well set up to do Surround and Destroy. I, the guy who was in the back to um, get the Surround and Destroy in the back um, was also my one that was maybe still, I think he was, he was maybe still out of range for getting dispelled, getting unbound. Um, so I believe what happened is I tried to cast Boggy Mist with him. And I rolled a one and a three. So I was like, shit. This this is bad. Um, but I know the plague sensor bearers are coming down this turn, and I really want the minus one to charge. You can see where this is going. I said, I can roll a primal at it. There's a one in six chance I primal miscast. Which would suck, but it's only a one in six chance, and I think I need the minus one to charge. So of course. I rolled the one, and I primal miscast, and not only did I primal miscast, but I rolled the three for the d3 mortal wounds, plus three that I needed to exactly kill myself and fail surround and destroy. So that was devastating. There was, there was a one in six chance that I failed, that I, that I primal miscast on that die, and then there was a one third chance that I killed myself, and I did both. And I was just like, well, that was like, Honestly, like that was a risk that I needed to take, and I just got fucked on the dice roll. So like it, it happens, but like I don't consider that a mistake. I think that was a play I needed to try and make. And it just didn't work out. So like I can't be too mad about that. Like I can't be mad at myself for that. Like I needed to take that risk. Damien said he was like he was like that's I would have done the same thing. Like the odds were that it would work out and like you kind of needed that. So like whatever. But so, so I failed my tactic, I blew myself up, I think I did a couple wounds to things that were like nearby, because he was, you can see just the edge of the base, I think he was actually in the garrison. Um, so he, he might have been in unbind range, um, which another, yeah, that was another reason I was sad I rolled a four initially, because like even throwing primals at it, he might have unbound the spell. Um, I did forget to say, I think God's right miscast turn one, but I'll... I was going to talk about that anyway when I talk about my turn one plan. Um, so yeah, so I got three points turn three. His turn three, he does Intimidate, and he finally brings down the Sensor Bearers. So he brought down one kind of in my bottom left flank. Um, they were more in the corner. This is after moving the next turn. So this is, this is like a turn four picture. So he had come down back here. He was, you know, nine away. I believe he failed to charge. Maybe he did, maybe he did charge, because there was a... No, there was a kill, though. Anyway, he must, have, he must have failed to charge the turn he came down. The other sensor bears came down up here and didn't really affect too much other than wiping out the unit of gut rippers. But anyway, he got surrounded and destroy... Or no, intimidate. He got intimidate turn three and five points. So at this point, it's 15 to... 11, I'm down 4, and I'm like, ooh, I'm like digging a hole here, and I'm not going to be able to get out of it, I don't think. Because like, the sensor bears are down, they're going to start killing things. Like, I'm never taking this point back now, because it's corrupted by the plague pack, and Hobgrots are kind of fighting it out with clan rats, and can actually do okay against clan rats, but like, they're not going to do well enough to get through the clan rats and the plague pack in time to really get me points. Uh, you can see some of them had died. And then, if that really was a danger, he could have committed the sensor bearers over there to kill them, but I, I don't think he would have needed to anyway. Um, and on the left, yeah, so turn three, I did let into the Maelstrom, which I succeeded. Um, I think I basically did, yeah, I think I charged Hobgrots, maybe the Gut Rippas over this way, and the Sludge Raker up into Thankwall. I did, you know, whatever. I succeeded, led into the Maelstrom, but I still only held the middle point. I forget why. 5, 10. Whatever. I, I think maybe that turn I didn't kill enough clan rats or something. For whatever reason, I don't think I took this point back. 
It may have been that Gobsprack died somehow. I don't remember. Either way, whatever. Either way, I got three points turn four. He did Surround and Destroy turn four and got that. And so I was I was down too many points. I wasn't going to win. Um, I conceded at that point. Um, he had gotten... Right, his turn four, he charged in the... I think it was turn four, he charged in the sensor barriers and picked up, like... Right, he picked up the bow, Gobsprack, and these Bolt Boys with one unit of sensor barriers, which is, like, totally reasonable for 15, 15 sensor barriers, because they can do 120 wounds. <laughs> that's a fair, you know, that's the max if everything hits and wounds. So he picked up all of that. He picked up these guys with the other unit of sensor barriers. And... The Sludge Raker had failed to kill Fangwall. You just you you can't kill Fangwall by doing chip damage because he heals every combat phase. So like the Sludge Raker went in and didn't get him, um, and it was just like at that point like Fangwall had nine wounds on him, but he never died. I was never going to take any points back. Like it, it was the game was over. So the game ended turn four. We call it. Um, it ended up twenty six to sixteen him. So the thing I wanted to talk about was um, this turn one. I I think I could have won this game if I just committed way harder to the bit and really alphaed Thankwall and these characters turn one, more so than I did. So I think what I should have done, and I think I... I think I partially tried this. So I ended up, you know, I ended up super sneaking the Nash Duke up here. I think I should have deployed. So the the Bolt Boys in the garrison were fine. That that's all good. Um I think I probably should have put the other three Bolt Boys also in the garrison, because you could put ten models in there. So they could both pop out within six and both be in range of Thankwell turn one. I don't know why I didn't just put them both in there. They were stupid. Maybe I just thought that was lame. I don't know. I'm a dumbass. But I should have put both of them in there so all nine could shoot at Thankwall first turn. I should have put the... And, you know, part of this, he had way more drops than me. Like, when I put the kill bow out, I probably didn't know that Thankwall was going to go exactly there. So, like, he probably put him... You know, he put him there so the kill bow couldn't shoot Thankwall. Whatever, that's fine. Would have been great if I could have shot Thankwall with the kill bow turn one. Um... I think instead of having the Nash Tooth back here, I also should have just had the Nash Tooth on the line. So instead of um, instead of having to super sneaky him up, I could have just fastened and moved him 20 up turn one. And then I think what I should have done, I think I should, I almost think I should have just full hard committed and super sneakied the Sludge Raker nine outside of Thankwell. Um, or whatever, nine outside the um, would have been nine outside the clan rats, so it would have been like ten or eleven outside of Thankwall, but I moved eight, um, and then had a good chance to get the Sludge Raker, Nash Tooth, nine Bolt Boys, all of the Thankwall turn one, and maybe even um, sneaking my asthma Gobsprack up turn one to go fourteen twenty eight and get Gobsprack in there as well. Um, I think even just. I think if I had committed the Nash Tooth and Gobsprack, that probably would have been enough. Um, so maybe I should have actually super sneaky Gobsprack up, just so I knew I wouldn't have to cast Sneaky Miasma to get up there. But either way, um, I think I should have committed two or even all three of my Hitty characters up there turn one. And like I said, that would have made him... He would have either lost... You know, this is like... Two play priests, vermin lord, thankwell. I think I definitely would have gotten thankwell turn one, and maybe like depending on ordering in the combat, like if thankwell was already dead or close, could have still gotten like the gracie or two. Um, but anyway, the I think I was I think I was planning to super or not super sneaky uh, sneaky my asthma gobsprack up and gobsprack miscast on his first cast turn one. So that is the two wounds, I believe, on Gobsprack in the later pictures. So that part of the plan would have failed anyway, which is why I'm like, I think I should have just put the Nash Tooth up on the line 
to fasten turn one and go 20. And I should have super sneakied up Godsprack into the middle. Both because, yeah, yeah, this is the game that I should have super sneaked Godsprack up because then he would have, I could have thrown Godsprack in in addition to the Nash Tooth and maybe gotten Thankwell. And then Godsprack would have been up in Unbind range so that he didn't have a free Magic Dominance turn one, even if I didn't quite get Thankwell. So, yeah, this was, this was like 100% a lesson in if you're going to go for, if you have a plan that you think is going to work to like win the game, or like, whatever. if you have a plan, you need to commit to the plan and not half-ass it. I feel like I had a plan here, but I did not commit hard enough to it. And so instead of winning me the game turn one, potentially, it just did nothing, essentially. Like, I got a grace here. Woo, whoop de doo Like, who cares? So, so yeah, that is my read on this game, is that I should have just, knowing that I could take first and was going to gamble on taking off the clan rats, I... I I was kind of hedging my bets, I think, if I, like, failed to pick up the clan rats to, like, not be just with my ass out, whatever. But I could have taken first turn anyway and cleaned things up. I think I should have, yeah. I think I should have just super sneakied either Gobsprack or even the Sludraker, although that feels aggressive, um, up to take out Tangle first turn. Probably just Gobsprack. Probably just super sneaky Gobsprack up. Do the fast and... Fast and... Or, yeah, do fast and... and get the Nash Truth in there, and have all nine Bolt Boys able to shoot Tank Hall first turn. The other thing that would have done is let me cast Nasty Hex on Thank Wall to turn off his ward save, which would have made killing him a piece of cake and put a lot more pressure on. So this was, yeah, this was just like, oh man, hindsight is twenty twenty. This felt like, this felt like a game that, since he didn't see the Disappearing Act coming, I could have won based off of that. But then once that whole play didn't work out, um, I was just kind of too much in the hole, and he was too good of a player to you know, make an easy game. <laughs> Not, no games here were going to be easy, but... Um, and then, whatever. You know, I dropped two points off of a stupid mistake, so I could have gotten two more there. And then I dropped two points off of a primal miscast, which, like, again, I felt I kind of had to go for. So, like, if those two things hadn't have gone wrong... We would have been tied. No, I would have been up two points going into turn four if that if those things had gone right. Like if I had just not made the mistake of shooting the clan rats, we would have been tied going into turn four. And if I didn't blow up my shaman, I would have been up going into turn four. Instead, I was down two points going into turn four, and then down four points going to turn five, and like. That's rough. Um, uh, anyway, so that was that was game one. It was good to play Damien. It was fun to play somebody from from Europe. Um, I will say that there were there were a bunch of French guys there. I think they had the biggest contingent after the U.S. and maybe Canada. Um, they all had like their jerseys. Like they were all excited to be there. They had a big French flag. Like. The, the French, it seems like the French scene's really good, the competitive scene. Um, seemed like they had a good group of folks there. So, great. So I lost game one. Game two, I was playing Victor uh, Sivronsky, I believe his name. Uh, sorry if I slightly mispronounced that. Playing KO, who are my nemesis. I hate KO. But if I'm going to play KO, it might as well be with Grinning Blades, and they can't see me from outside of 12. So that's great. Uh, however, the tilting thing was uh, round two was Frozen Zephyr, so I couldn't see the KO either. So my whole advantage of my army against other shooting armies I, is gone in Zephyr, and of course I draw into KO on that map. So like this was the worst map I could have drawn for KO. Uh, which was really annoying. Um, Victor has a very cool army that's like these like land boats. Yeah, I mean, you can see the this is a gun hauler, is this little walker? These little like bunker tunnel things are the screaming bridge, um, 
and he's just he's got a very cool army. Um, yeah, maybe he was in the maybe he was in that tie for fourth place with me. I'm not sure. Um, I didn't take as many pictures of this one, um, but again, this was a game that started off very well for me. Um, so turn one, I did magic dominance. He doesn't have any dispels. He didn't. I was surprised he didn't pop the pouch of Nullus that turn, just to make it harder for me and scarier for me. Um, and he also chose not to like do heroic willpower. Um, so I got magic dominance first turn. I took um, took these two points. His turn one, he did opening salvo, so he killed something. Maybe maybe it was like Hopgrotz over here or something. I don't know, whatever. He killed something turn one, but did not take two points, so he got three points turn one. Turn two, I did sneak up. Um, he did blast them off the point or something. I don't know, whatever. KO things. But again, I got five and he got three turn two. So like I was like, all right. I'm doing great. The other big thing turn two was the Zephyr immediately went away turn two. So I was like, hell yeah, the Zephyr's gone. I can shoot him now. He can't shoot me. This is going to be great. Um, the thing that went horribly turn two is what I think is a bad judge ruling. Um, so he, yeah, he was basically here. He had moved up and like shot off um, stuff that was on this point. At this point, the Ironclad was here, right there, um, and yeah, he had put he had put the Thunders out. So my turn two, I like moved up a bit. I was still kind of staying out of range with things a little bit, getting ready for turn three. Um, you know, stay, staying outside of range for getting shot back. He had committed the screening bridge to go over here to this point, essentially. Um, I should say his turn... Two? Anyway, no, I'm thinking of a different game. Whatever. Anyway. So, right, turn two. I'm, like, moving up. I'm kind of staying out of shooting range still before I commit. And I was like, all right, these... The Bolt Boys, the six Bolt Boys, were kind of back here and out of range of the Thunders and here. But... I go, all right, they're going to hop in the garrison, and that's not a normal move, so I'm going to be able to shoot you. Because the, this and the Thunders were within 24 of this garrison. And he was kind of like, oh shit, like, I didn't realize that was a thing. And he was like, I don't, I don't think that's how it works, or like, I don't believe you, essentially. Um, so the, word is, the wording on getting into a garrison is you can, um, you can garrison the defensible terrain, Instead of making a normal move, if you are wholly within six of the defensible terrain. So I'm like, oh, well, you know, it's, there's like articles out there about how you can get extra range on your bolt boys using garrison shenanigans. Um, I was like, look, there's like articles out there about this. Like the wording is instead of a normal move, the wording on bolt boys is if you make a normal move, you go down to 12 inch range. This is instead of making a normal move, which in English implies you did something other than make a normal move. Essentially, it's governing when you can get into the garrison, not saying that you're making a normal move to get into the garrison. So if you could make a normal move, you can, instead of making a normal move, get into the garrison. So like, if you're in combat, you couldn't make a normal move, you can't get into a garrison. That is what that clause is governing. But he was like, do you mind if we like call a judge over? I was like, yeah, sure. So James, he was great. Um, but James, I dislike you for this very one specific thing. Um, James happened to be the judge walking by, and we were like, hey, here's the deal. And James was like, oh, yeah, I think that counts as a normal move, but, like, I'll go talk to another judge. So he went and talked to, uh, I think Ted, I don't know, somebody else, and, like, they looked at the rules, and they were like, oh, well, it says instead of a normal move, so that means it's a normal move, which I was like, this is, that's, like, nonsensical, but, like, it's a judged tournament, like the judges made a call. I was like, I was like, all right. I was like, Victor, I'm a little tilted because I think that's wrong, but like that is the way the judges ruled, so that's the way we will play it. Um, all right, I guess my Bolt Boys can't shoot this turn. Great. Um, I believe that ended up losing me the game, actually, because turn three was the turn I decided to commit. 
Um, so I did Lead into the Maelstrom. I got, I think I got the Ironclad. Must not have been with, sh must not have been with shooting, because you can see, Gobsprack looks like he charged the Ironclad. I guess I must have taken this right after he picked up the Ironclad. So I did let in. I oh, <laughs> sorry. One more thing. The other unfortunate thing that happened turn two is is he picked up. He must have, with the Thunders, picked up like some Hobgrots and maybe the whole unit of like 20 Gut Rippas from my front lines. Or maybe it was the unit of 10 and some of the unit of 20. Anyway, he picked up a bunch of stuff with the Thunders. And then it turned out just I was a little bit sloppy. Um, my Snatch a Boss, he did get within 12 inches of the Snatch Boss with the. Um, Gun hauler. I was like, that's it's probably fine. I like all that defense. Oh my god. He hit and wounded with like all five shots. And I failed every single armor save and took 10 damage on my sludge raker from one gun hauler volley. And I was just like, you have to be fucking kidding me. <laughs> like my big hitty monster general piece that's about to go in and like try and win me the game is suddenly bracketed already and almost dead. I was like, this is some bullshit. So, like, just a super, super unlucky roll for me turn two, or, yeah, turn two on his gun hauler shots. Like, just fucking obliterated, almost, the Sludge Raker. And then an extremely tilting judge ruling that was incorrect um, to make me not be able to shoot the Bolt Boys. The six, seven Bolt Boy shots, I probably, I, I'm not 100% sure, I probably would have shot the Thunders. But either way, I would have either killed some Thunders, or there's actually a good chance that that volley of Bolt Boy shots can kill the Gun Hauler, in which case my Sledge Raker is at full health going in to combat. Um, and yeah, I, Jacob, Brandon, I was talking in Discord, I was like, can you believe this ruling? And like he went into AOS Coach chat and was like, hey, Gareth, Madigan, whoever, like, can Bolt Boys, you know, how, how does this work? And they were both like, oh yeah, like exactly what, what I, like on my side. So I was just like, oh my god, like I, I guess I asked the wrong judge. I should have asked Gareth, but like them's the breaks. So the, anyway, it, I, I think it ended up losing me the game because turn three I went in for Lead into the Maelstrom. Um, you can see I did, um, I did the Cool Boys Vlog. I think I picked Gobsprack, Sledge Raker, and Nash Tooth. Um, I believe I did like eleven wounds to the gut of the ironclad with the killbow, <laughs> which is amazing. Obviously, um, I got through the armor. I may have even rolled. I may have even rolled the six so that it was mortals actually. <laughs> so I got really lucky to start off the shooting phase with that onto the ironclad. Um, I did some with the bolt boys as well, and then I believe I activated gobsprack first and got the ironclad with gobsprex attacks because you can you can see it's pretty obvious he charged the, the ironclad um i think that's what's happened so i was like i was riding high at this point i was like i picked up the ironclad i'm ahead in points i'm ahead like four points i'm gonna get my five again this turn unless i kill everything i'm in contact with <laughs> which like it was possible Oh, the other thing that was super lucky for me that happened, I did get, I had some very good luck this game in a couple ways. Um, he had split shots shooting Gut Rippas and Hobgrots. And I think he killed like five Hobgrots in this unit. And I rolled, whatever, I, I rolled like low enough that one Hobgrot survived after Battle Shock. And I was able to charge Hogrod in first, then into these Thunderers to eat Unleash Hell, and so he just didn't Unleash Hell. So I was able to get all this stuff in and not get unleashed upon. He may have unleashed Hell with the Gun Hauler onto the Nash Tooth. I don't remember. Or maybe with, like, whatever. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, the moral of the story is um, I believe I picked up 
all but three of these thunders this turn. So the Bolt Boys not getting to shoot was huge because if they had gotten a volley off into these thunders and picked up three, there's a really, really good chance that with that volley, I would have eliminated one of the two units of thunders. And at that point, he has no ironclad and just a unit of foot slogging four inch move thunders back here that are never going to get up far enough. You know, they're never going to like catch my bolt boys to shoot them. They're never going to take these two points back, and I'm just going to score out for the win. So instead, what happened was I think I did pick up the gun hauler, but like I said, I picked up all but like three of these, and then I think their little like fumigator mortal things at the end of combat killed the sludge raker because he was down four wounds. Um, and then the rest of the way the rest of the game played out, um, he and did yeah he in turn three did whatever the KO tactic to go from having less objectives than me to more objectives than me, and was able to, maybe the gun hauler survived and that's what he got subjected with or something. I'm not sure. Anyway, what the, the moral of the story is, he killed all of this. He has four up rallies, so this front most, this, this front unit of Thunderers was able to rally up to like six, or I'm sorry, he rallied back up to like nine models over the next two turns since I didn't finish them off. Um, because he had enough shooting to clean this up here, and then he was able to move on to this with those nine thunderers, and like suddenly I couldn't really take it back. Um, so my turn four I did intimidate because I had enough left to do that. He did let into the maelstrom turn four with like maybe the admiral and something, um, and then turn five he did intimidate, and I just like didn't have an army left. He like blew off the rest of my army with the Thunders that had rallied back and, like, these guys were moving up. Um, I do think... Um, I, I made this mistake once or twice in this tournament. So, sorry. So, I got one point last turn. So, the, the game ended up 21 to 21, and since I dropped that last tactic last turn, I failed the Grand Strat, and so he won the tiebreaker. So, it was a tie game, and then he won the tiebreaker. So, it was super close. Um... So the judge ruling really changed things, I think, or at least potentially, like, that was the game based on the fact that, like, based on how close it was at the end. And then the mistake I made is I should have, um, I should have pulled these Bolt Boys out of the garrison a turn earlier so that then I had a turn where they could move and get double shots. And that maybe would have been enough to help me clean up the Thunders that were left and still let me win the game. So there was also a mistake that I made that could have swung it my way. I was I, I there there were one or two times in the tournament where I was just like too, much too conservative with keeping my bolt boys hidden in the garrison. Oh, because I had also covered them in mud, and um, we actually still not sure. We at the beginning of the game we were like, yeah, if you're in a garrison, you're in you're in cover. And then like he looked it up afterwards and was like, oh, it actually doesn't say you're in cover. But then. I'm still unclear as to whether 100% you're in cover if you're in a garrison. Because um, garrison says separately, like, you get plus one save and whatever. Um, kind of the same thing that cover does. But anyway, we were playing it that they were invisible in the garrison. But the turn I committed, anyway, I should have just popped them out because he was going to have to be dealing with all this stuff, and then I could have moved and gotten the double shot. So that was, that was kind of the big mistake I think I made that turn, or that game. Um, other than that, I thought I played it okay. I, you know, I had screened out the shooting, the twelve-inch shooting, as well as I could. I slightly messed up so that the gun hauler got into the sledge raker, but he really should have done, you know, on average he should have done like four wounds, maybe not ten. And it just happened that he got everything through and did ten wounds. So like, I could have played a, I could have played that a little better and had him back half an inch further and not have him got shot. Um, but it may have even worked out in my favor, because he may have, like, if he couldn't have shot that, he may have killed this last Hobgrot, and then he would have gotten his Unleash Hell with the Thunder unit when I went into combat. Um, but it was a super good game. It was super close, obviously. You know, he won on Tiebreaker. Um, it was very nice to meet Victor. He's a 
cool dude. His painting's really nice. His army's really good. Um, I talked to him a few more times throughout the weekend, um, and I consider that I made a friend this game, um, despite the fact that he is a filthy Kato player. <laughs> so it was very nice to meet Victor. Um, yeah, that was, the only, that was the only picture I really had for this game. Um, but that was day one. Um, day two, I'll talk about in my next video. Day two was three games. So I played Frederick Schmidt, played Duncan Bills, and I played um, the sub Dave for Josh Bennett, game three. Uh, but that is it for now. Um, I'll try to be timely about getting parts two and three up in the next couple days. It's Thanksgiving break, so certainly won't be working. Uh, but I hope you enjoyed this, and I will be back soon.